Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Anne Marie Slaughter, the CEO of New America. New America is a think and action tank uh, dedicated to renewing the promise of America uh, by unlocking the potential of its people and the power of its ideals. I'm delighted uh, to be welcoming you uh, to this uh, conversation uh, about technology and job quality. Uh, and I'm delighted particularly to be joined by Kay Firth Butterfield, uh, who is the executive director of the World Economic Forum's uh, Center for Trustworthy Technology. Uh, and she and I will open today's webinar. So since 2021, uh, the Center for Education and Labor at New America, which we call SELNA, uh, and the World Economic Forum have undertaken a research and storytelling project uh, that is led by our joint fellow, Shailen Jotishi, uh, to ensure that workplace technologies uh, that are rooted in AI uh, and also other emerging technologies make jobs better, not worse. We, we hear all the uh, horror stories of the robots coming and automation uh, taking over jobs. This is a project to look at how you can harness those technologies to create better jobs. Uh, and this really builds on a long commitment at New America to realize a future of work worth building, uh, a future of good work, of good jobs. Uh, and we've long been committed to, to both understanding and promoting the ways in which we can maximize the benefits of technology while mitigating the risks. So just one recent example, this past February, New America and Bloomberg revisited the findings of our joint shift commission on work, workers, and technology, which Bloomberg Beta and New America uh, undertook five years ago. Uh, that commission engaged over 100 leaders uh, in business, technology, uh, policy, academia, and civic organizations and surveyed over a thousand Americans to study and anticipate what the future of work in America would look like. Uh, you can see uh, the reference uh, in the chat uh, to that report. At that point, we were looking at how would there be more work or less work? Would there be more tasks or more jobs? Because you could imagine a future of less work and it's all tasks, and you could imagine a future of more work uh, and all jobs, but the, the likelihood would be somewhere in between. That is, those are still questions worth asking, but in the meantime, uh, certainly generative AI and other emerging technologies have, have come, have really um, emerged faster than any of us, I think, uh, expected. And at the same time, of course, we've had the pandemic and lots of changes in work habits. Uh, so uh, we are, we, we affirmed a number of the findings of that shift commission. Uh, but now we're really looking more at augmentation than automation. Uh, and that's very important. Uh, the augmentation, the question is, what are we going to augment? Uh, and it looks like an opportunity for both uh, employers and workers to benefit, but only by design. It's not going to be naturally uh, that way. In headline after headline, we've seen new workplace technologies like algorithm, algorithmic management, making jobs harder, uh, trying to cram in every last hour in ways that make schedules highly unpredictable, also sometimes more dangerous uh, and infringing on civil liberties, uh, or particularly having a damaging impact on black, brown, and other marginalized communities. So we began this work long before ChatGPT uh, and other tools came onto the scene. But today, uh, those headlines are, are uh, ever more present, uh, and the urgency of this project uh, is ever more present. So our goal is to find ways that these technologies can be a win-win, both for workers and for employers. Uh, and we are really delighted to be doing this in uh, partnership with the World Economic Forum, which has its own tradition, as you'll hear, of looking at uh, work and the future of work. Uh, and so before I turn it over to Shailen uh, Jotishi to kick off our first panel, I want to turn to Kay Firth Butterfield uh, to welcome you on behalf of the World Economic Forum. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie, very much. And thanks to all of you who have joined us for this important conversation today. 
As Anne-Marie said, I'm Kay Firth Butterfield and I'm currently the Executive Director of the World Economic Forum's Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which focuses on trustworthy technology. But previous to that, I was Head of AI at the World Economic Forum and in that capacity um, was also head of this work that um, we have been doing with New America and particularly with Shailin. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about, you know, what's the Center for Trustworthy Technology, because we will be hoping to continue this work that we've been doing with um, New America and Shailin into the future. And um, although obviously Anne-Marie and everybody is talking about generative AI, generative AI isn't the only cutting edge technology that is actually needing to be trustworthy as we approach the, uh, approach, uh, the next stage uh, of, of humanity. And so one of the things that we particularly want to be able to do is to have these conversations, these essential conversations, around what does it mean to be human in the next 10 and 20 years? How do we work comfortably with um, technology of all sorts of different kinds? And um, how do we plan today for the, what, we want to, what we want our society to look like in the future? And so we will be, um, as I say, we're brand new. So we will be creating a lot of these, um, a lot of these closed conversations of the right people to hopefully um, move that, move the policy forward, but also with companies to help them see that actually it's profitable and it's purposeful and it's the right thing to do to think about trustworthy use of technology, trustworthy design of technology, um, and trustworthy development of these technologies. So of course, I echo all of Anne-Marie's wonderful comments, and we have been delighted to have this partnership with Shailin and New America. So you may be asking, why is this project important? Why do we need to be focused on ensuring that the workplace technologies rooted in AI, AR, VR, and advanced robotics improve job quality, advanced trust, whilst also improving productivity and savings costs. So beyond what Anne-Marie so thoughtfully talked about, I just wanted to say saving productivity and costs really isn't everything. I know at the moment it could be seen as everything because companies are in a difficult financial situation and we are potentially in a in a financial crisis but to ensure the use of technologies which help cut cost and increased pro productivity we shouldn't just be focusing on well this machine can do the job of 10 people what we what is much more important um, for our society and for humanity is how does this machine work with this human being and ensure that this human being's job is more satisfactory and um, to, more satisfying to them as a human being, but also reduces those productivity and cost savings. I think it's important as well that we think about how workers should be reassured this is actually enhancing their work and not stealing their jobs, the point that Anne-Marie made so, so eloquently earlier. And that workers should actually enjoy their jobs more and be more productive because they're working with um, these technologies. Trust in cutting edge tech you know, it's vital to their successful, it's, it's successful integration into society, not just the workplace. If workers are worried that it goes, worried, then that worry actually feeds out beyond the workplace, leading to a general malaise about tech. And one of the things that, you know, worries me perpetually is that 
so many of these you know, cutting edge technologies can benefit humanity so much if we get them right. But if we don't get them right, then the backlash could be significant and we'll lose those benefits. So that's why the center's delighted to be involved in this work and continuing it. Um, at the center, we're going to be looking at the care of aged populations using AI and robotics, as well as AI and healthcare generally. So this piece of work that we've been doing is absolutely foundational for our further conversations and the production of frameworks and guidelines from which we can try and plan a better future for all. So with that said, it's my absolute pleasure to um, introduce you to our panel moderator and the project leader, Shailen Jyoti, Jyoti Jyoti Shi. I'm sorry, Shailen, I, I must have said your name a hundred times and now I can't. Um, so Shailen is the Future of Work Fellow at New America and a Fellow at the World Economic Forum. He also serves as Senior Manager of the Burning Glass Institute. His mission is to solve public problems concerning the workforce, education, policy, technological innovation and their intersections. Shailen was previously visiting scholar in science and technology policy at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, where he co-authored a forthcoming book on science policy that will be published by MIT Press next year. And I'm sure that we're all keen to read it. He also served as a program director at the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, as CEO of the Journal of Science Policy and Governance, and held policy roles at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the University of Michigan. His work has appeared in the Washington Post, Politico, Forbes, the Financial Times, and a variety of other outlets. He graduated from the University of Georgia and Arizona State. So Shailen, on to you for our wonderful panel. Well, thanks so very much, Kay, and thanks very much, Anne-Marie, and thanks very much to all of you for joining us for this discussion. I'll go over a quick housekeeping notes before we dive into our main event. Over the course of the discussion, we invite you to share your reflections on Twitter or LinkedIn using the hashtag Better Future of Work. Additionally, please share your questions in the chat. We'll be collecting them and we'll respond to them during the Q&A segment after our panel. So as Anne-Marie and Kay uh, uh, very eloquently summarized, uh, today we have the great privilege of hosting one of the first dialogues around our joint project to really ensure that workplace technologies are a win-win for workers and employers in the US and beyond. As both referenced, this work has evolved quite a lot since we began this journey at the height of the pandemic, but our mission, uh, our mission remains unchanged. In this work, we aim to help convene the communities, understand the issues, elevate the voices, and tell the stories that will serve as an unlock towards a future of work worth working. For those of you who are not familiar with this project, I will drop the link in the chat and hope that this conversation inspires you to engage. If you wish to do so, please feel free to reach out. We're at a key inflection point in which the human decisions we make today concerning the technology and the use of those technologies will lead us either to a future in which the average American, the average person will experience work in a way that advances meaning and makes jobs better, easier. Yes, makes us more productive, but as Kay said, dare I say happier and engaged in this thing we call work, this thing we spend most of our waking hours doing or preoccupied with or preparing for by way of education and training all throughout childhood. Um, or we could inherit a future in which we have a very different reality. Too often, we've seen technologies have quite the contrary effect. Tech can just as easily make jobs worse as they can better. So today, we have a great group of thinkers and doers to add their insights and wisdom in helping us understand what steps policymakers and technologists, labor leaders, business executives, and others must take in order to design for workplace tech 
universe that can achieve this win-win balance. Without further ado, we'll introduce our panel. And as a reminder, hashtag better future of work to share your reflections on Twitter, LinkedIn. Feel free to tag our, our panelists and questions can come in the chat. First up, we have B. Cavello, who is the Director of Emerging Technologies at Aspen Digital, a project of the Aspen Institute. B. is a technology and facilitation expert who is passionate about creating social change by empowering everyone to participate in the process of social and technological governance. Previously, they were a tech policy advisor in Congress and before that led research on fairness and transparency and important for our discussion. Uh, AI's impact on labor at the Partnership on AI. They were a senior engagement lead for IBM Watson and among many esteemed hats was a product director at Exploding Kittens, now well-known card game startup. Thank you for being here with us, Pete. Next, we have Tom Kokun, the post-tenure George Maverick Bunker professor at the MIT Sloan School of Bit Management and a faculty member at MIT's Institute for Work and Employment Research. Dr. Koken's research has long served as a bedrock for us in the tech and labor space with a focus on the need for a new social contract at work, one that can anticipate the technological and social changes uh, in a way that builds towards a more inclusive economy and towards shared prosperity, which was part of the topic of a book that he published in 2021 on shaping the future of work. Thank you very much for being with us, Tom. And finally, we have all the way from Europe, uh, Christina Kolklov, founder of the Why Not Lab, a, cons a consultancy that serves trade unions, governments, and public service organizations, among others. A fearless optimist, Dr. Kolklov's background is in labor market research and in the global labor movement, where she led their future for policies and advocacy and strategies for a number of years. She is the author of the union movement's first principles of workers' data rights and ethics of AI, among many other trusted positions. Thank you very much for being here with us, Christina. So without further ado, we're gonna dive into our discussion. I have, I have some questions for panelists and then we'll uh, again open it up for a Q&A. So please feel free to drop your questions in the chat. Um, first off, I'd like to do a quick temperature read of our panel. And for those of you in the audience, again, please feel free to engage in the chat. You can say, I agree, I disagree. Panelists, please raise your hand if you believe that in five years time, the average American worker will enjoy improved working conditions and job quality as a result of the impact technology has made on their jobs. And technology in this scenario includes AI, AR, VR, advanced robotics, the full gamut. Let's see. Hmm. Yeah, so. Let's see uh, uh, if folks in the chat uh, would like to engage. Clearly our panelists have views. So um, how about in 10 years time? Will the job quality for average American worker be improved due to the impact of technology on work? Raise your hand. Hmm. So in the five to 10 year horizon, a visa in, in the maybe camp. All right. So yeah, see, well, it, really, it really depends on whether we change yeah. how we do this. So that's what we should get at. How do Absolutely. you make sure that we improve the quality of jobs? And we all have views on that, but it starts by having workers have a voice in the early stages and uh, in designing these technologies. So it's not, will it happen? It won't happen unless we change the conditions under which technology is being brought in right now. So we're getting ahead of ourselves, but I think the question was too uh, much yeah. as if, well, will it happen on its own? <laughs> So that's a great segue for my first question, which is for you, Christina. Christina, you've been deeply involved in helping labor unions worldwide build capacity to, to deal with workplace technologies. Could you give us a brief state of play? How are unions grappling with new workplace technologies? Are they prepared? What's working well? What are the pinch points? And to Tom's point, you know, what's the opportunity for elevating worker voice here? would love to hear your thoughts. So thank you, and thank you really for, for having me. It's, it's an honor. So firstly, I think we have to recognize that what the labor unions are up against is a total neglect of the labor market significance in the digital age. Our politicians are willing to regulate the market, but they are very unwilling 
to look at the effects of these technologies on the labor market. So they're up against that. And then secondly, they're up against sort of um, that they don't know what they don't know. That any of us who spent time with technologists, we realize, you know, like small windows in the brain are being opened because can technology really do this? Can it really track and monitor this and this and this? So when you're kept in the dark, when you don't know what you should know, then of course, building response becomes even more difficult. But unions are really taking on board this, this uh, whole agenda about digital technologies, how it's affecting workers' rights, uh, human rights, but also importantly, how it's affecting having immediate effects here and now, but also in the future as algorithmic inferences become the truths that future workers are, are measured against. So stunningly, uh, maybe not surprising to many of you, but it's the same narratives, it's the same sort of things that they're backing against uh, across workplaces in the United States, to South Africa, to Europe, to Asia Pacific, to Latin America. Um, but what they're doing very much is, is sort of getting to understand the basics of these technologies so they can understand the means of the harms that are being created. The moment they understand the means is the moment they then can go in and, as many of you have mentioned so far, start co-governing or co-designing these technologies. But for all of that to happen, we need transparency. And, you know, just two weeks ago, I was in Canada and spoke for 600 people working in public services. And I asked them, have any of you been told in a clear language which digital technologies or algorithmic management systems your employers are using? none of them put their hands up. So we need transparency. So we know what we need to know so that we can begin uh, to form the response. And that has to be a mandatory uh, transparency. So I think unions are really taking this on board against all odds and with very, very little support, to be honest with you, because a lot of the narratives are industry driven and the industry sort of lobbyism is very strong. So, but they're doing that and they're doing that across the world and, and of course, where the impact of digital technologies can be slightly different uh, in various geographies, many of the challenges are the same. Yeah, absolutely. And Tom, reflecting on Christina's responses and you know your initial comments as well, you know, a Gallup poll from last fall revealed that public support for unionization in the U.S. is at a record high since 1965, and we've seen landmark unionization efforts at a surprisingly diverse set of new industries, which I should add think tanks to the category, America's unionized, in fact. Um, and you and Roy Bahat, uh, head of Bloomberg Beta, a good friend of ours, um, have written about the need for business leaders to really change their tune to managing an organized workforce and um, being more collaborative to worker voice entities. Um, first off, how has the workplace technology conversation around AI and ChatGPT uh, impacted how business leaders think about unions and worker voice? And then secondly, what needs to happen either from a policy perspective or a strategy perspective in order to move the needle on getting businesses and labor to partner to achieve a win-win uh, scenario for workplace technologies that are adopted? Well, thanks, Sean, and thanks everyone for this remarkable uh, panel and, and good discussion. I always learn a lot from Christina about uh, these issues. I'm delighted to uh, build on what she just said. And let me start with that because she made two points. One, workers and their unions need to get educated about what these technologies do. That's the first thing. And then number two, there has to be some transparency over uh, what these technologies are going to do are being designed to do. I don't think we're as far as we would like to be. Uh, I think I agree with Christina, the labor movement in general and some uh, specific unions are very much invested now in learning about the technology. So I think the first phase, that, that lesson of learning about them is underway. Everyone knows this is important, but what hasn't happened is we haven't had dialogue about how do you bring worker voice into the technology uh, design process, into the first phase of deciding what's the problem? What are the opportunities that we're asking these technologies 
to, uh, to solve for us. And I think that's where we've got to change our institutional arrangements. We've got to make sure that workers do have a voice. I don't think the average CEO even understands these technologies better than workers do. And the vendors, uh, uh, the developers of these technologies have not even thought about the, the need to bring workers and their representatives into the process. So it's up to us to set up the conditions and set up the opportunities for those dialogues. And it has to start early on. You can't wait until, as in the United States, unions negotiate over the effects of technologies on wages and working conditions. That's too late. We have to get involved right up front in the design phase. And there's lots of evidence from the auto industry in the 80s, through the IT industry in the 90s, through healthcare research and other research, both here in the United States and elsewhere, that when you bring workers and when you into the process and when you design the technology in parallel, in combination with designing changes in work processes, that's when you get the big payoffs to productivity and innovation and acceptance by the workforce of the technologies. But if we go the standard way of keeping these secret, having technologists design the technology around the problems they think are important, then you get overinvestment in technology and weak productivity and innovation results. So we've got to create the processes. Now, I'm not waiting for government to do that. That'll take forever. I think we should be bringing business leaders and labor leaders together, and we should be supporting that dialogue and helping to raise the right questions and asking them, how do they want to move forward? And that should happen at an industry level, and it should happen at a firm level. But I think it's our obligation to create those opportunities. We're prepared to do that at MIT, and so are lots of other places. But we've got to make sure that we get this dialogue and we don't leave workers only to be reassured by CEOs that they will be okay. They won't trust that and they shouldn't trust that. They shouldn't be reassured. They should have a positive, strong and well informed voice in the process of designing these and implementing these technologies. Absolutely, Tom. I really appreciated the comment on uh, identifying intermediaries or platforms in which business leaders and unions can come together um, and have some discussions uh, around these topics, even in lieu of, of governance and, and uh, public policy that would enable those. Uh, and B, this is a great segue to, to my question for you. You know, Tom mentioned the need to really bring the worker voice upstream to the point of technology development. And, you know, of course, before workplace tech can ever be debated by, by bosses and workers, it needs to be created first. And you've worked across the AI space, both as a policy specialist and a technologist. Um, it's no small question, B, but what should policymakers be prioritizing right now when thinking about regulation and governance of how these technologies are created and adopted? Are there any successful legislative or policy approaches or ideas, visions um, that you've seen in your work? Yeah, it's a great question. I will maybe challenge the idea that uh, the tech has to be developed before it can be debated. I think, you know, to Tom and Christina's great comments, um, there's so much value in uh, co-determination in employee governance. And, and frequently that means defining what success looks like before building the tools. And so I think that there is a lot of opportunity. Um, there is a lot of leadership from workers who really understand their work environment and their goals to be able to say, hey, these are the things that would be helpful to me. So I just want to name that. But you're absolutely right that um, policy plays a tremendously important role in kind of shaping the ecosystem within which technology is developed. And, and I want to name too that there are so many proposals right now, like 100% <laughs> honesty here. Uh, I kind of feel like it's been a, a, a DDoS, a, a uh, a, a denial of service attack on on uh, the system in that there are so many great things that governments around the world are considering and working on as it relates to AI and automation that like I frankly cannot keep track of all of them. Um, so it is it is 
a testament to how important these issues are and how uh, much I think the world has really woken up um, to the, the potential both for good and for bad of these tools. So there's a lot out there, but there are some things that I think are really promising. So, um, you know, as Tom had alluded to, and actually Partnership on AI put out a great um, AI and job quality insights um, document where they talk to a bunch of frontline workers about what they need and what they want. And, and we see that that workers do appreciate technology when it helps them to do their work and doesn't threaten their job. So um, I think that in that context, one area of policy that we want to see action in is in avoiding harms. How do we uh, make sure that when technology is introduced, um, as, as Christina and Tom alluded to, that there is transparency, not just in what the tech is doing, but what it's trying to do. What are the metrics? What are the goals? How do we define success? There's also a whole conversation, and I know Christina can speak on this uh, with, with so much more uh, fluency around kind of the, the data and surveillance and quantification of workers. There's a lot that policymakers can do, um, and we've seen already some action around data privacy and data rights um, being an, act, an, an area of uh, work that governments can put some real beef behind. But I'd also love to think not just about how do we avoid harms, but where are places where governments can actually take actions that might incentivize good behavior, that might actually promote positive signs. And I think that there are a couple of different areas um, where experimentation and um, some early leadership is really needed. So one thing is we know that these technologies can be disruptive to jobs. We know that that can, you know, the, the wonderful increased efficiencies that can come from technology can sometimes mean you need fewer workers to do a task than you previously needed to. So one place where um, policy and governments can take action in making that less threatening to workers is making it easier for people to change roles, giving people better safety nets, decoupling um, essential things like healthcare from our connection to our employers. Another area uh, where they can maybe shift that dynamic is thinking about what you know, what the, the larger financial uh, uh, ecosystem is incentivizing. The effective tax rate on technology, on capital, is lower than that on labor, which means it basically pushes companies toward, uh, you know, to save money, it's cheaper to use automation than um, to continue to value the workers who've been doing those jobs. So there might be opportunities to explore changing um, the way that capital and labor are taxed. And then finally, I think that, you know, a lot of these systems, we, we're coming up with uh, ways of measuring success. We pay attention to uh, you know, the quarterly revenue numbers or the jobs report. One thing that we don't have as much agreed upon metrics for, and I think that policy leadership could really, um, could really be a strong indicator on, is how do we measure and track job quality? How do we not just pay attention to how many people are employed, but the quality of that employment? And how do we honor and celebrate the places where job quality is really um, succeeding and where companies and, and workers are, are coming together to develop uh, ways of using technology that really support people's work and well-being. And I think if that we can create better leading indicators there, we'll have a better ecosystem of technology development, which then can, as you said, be debated by the bosses and workers and everyone else in the ecosystem. Absolutely, B. I, I, I really uh, appreciated the, the last comment you made there on, on metrics and indicators. I'd be remiss if I didn't say that um, this work we've undertaken began uh, as part of an OECD panel that uh, we had organized with uh, the OECD's AI team uh, in 2020. And Reen Conway from the Aspen Institute was one of my panelists for that and uh, had raised a similar similar notion. And, you know, it just goes to show that there's still a great need for that. I'm going to open this question up to the full panel, if anyone would. Yes, Christina, please weigh in. No, but I can't help. I we have two of my most favorite people, Tom and B here. And I, I just really want to to comment back on some of the things they said, but also with a little wink in my eye, challenge some of the things. Several of you have mentioned we should increase productivity or in increase pro productivity is a per natural goal. Listen, we're producing ourselves to hell in this planet. Maybe, and I want to pick up on what B was saying, maybe we need to change the metrics. When is a company evaluated as doing good or doing bad? 
And productivity doesn't have to be the measurement uh, that the market judges uh, these, these actions against. So I, I want to challenge that. I think the future of work could be a work that it's not organized around productivity as the sole measure of success, so to speak. And then uh, something that, that uh, Tom alluded to, and this was how do we really take note of that the management labor or labor management relationship is really changing into a three-party relationship. And that's labor management in deploying companies and then the developers. The developers who oftentimes have access to the data, who may be even offering data analysis back to the deploying company. So it's getting quite messy. It's, it's messy waters. But the only body in all of that who's really losing out right now and is losing bargaining power are the workers. So I think we need, and this is picking up on what B was, was answering to, we really need uh, to focus on mandatory inclusive governance, i.e. that these technologies ex ante, ex post, must be governed and they should be governed with representatives of those who are subjects of these systems at the table, i.e. in the case of the workplace, the workers. I'm very much in agreement with what Tom said that, that we have systems where, what is their purpose? What, what, you know, what were the instructions to the systems? Who's defined them? Is it the third party, the developers who's defined ultimately the purpose? Well, then even management is losing out, right? So inclusive governance, I think, is something that we should demand uh, by law. Uh, unfortunately, it is not in any worldwide discussion right now. The closest you get is Europe, but that's only ex ante impact assessments and nothing ex post. And then my last comment uh, to, to what Tom and B said is very much, um, B, you use the word to promote. And I really think we should promote rights. Right now, the rhetoric is around risks. What are the risks of these systems? How can we promote our fundamental rights, our human rights, but also, of course, labor rights? How can we make that a goal of these technologies uh, more than anything else? Um, but yeah, I just I couldn't help but pitch in on those those things. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. B, Tom, would you like to respond? Yeah, Tom, please. Well, let me uh, uh, just uh, echo what Christina said about rights. In the United States, we have a particular problem that workers don't have the right to uh, have a voice on the decision about what kind of technologies uh, will affect their jobs or uh, even whether technology investments will be made or not. And that's where the key starting points come from. These algorithms are designed by people. They are not some law of physics or mathematics. They're chosen to optimize certain outcomes. That's where we've got to have workers have a right to participate in those issues. That's a change in our national labor law. Uh, changing labor law in the United States is very, very difficult. I've been uh, involved in that for many years and it's very frustrating, but I think we've got, this is an opening. This is an area where I think we could create opportunities for experimentation with worker voice. And we would, we would see that when you do that, you get better results than what this title win-win uh, uh, of this uh, discussion is all about. So I think we've got to bring some new uh, uh, legislation, some new uh, opportunities. Uh, in the United States, the Biden administration is trying to do this with some of its government investments and in encouraging employers to um, uh, create high quality jobs and to be engaged with their workforce and with unions on these issues. We've got to promote uh, those initiatives, and we got to experiment with them and show that they 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 pay off. And just on the job quality, I'll just make a, another pitch. Uh, a number of us are working with various foundations right now to try to create a national job quality longitudinal survey, so that not only do we track the unemployment rate, but we track the quality of jobs over time, and that we get enough data about who is whose jobs are are getting better and whose are not. And where does technology fit into that? So we need we need to get started with that process um, and and build uh, uh, the right kind of indicators into our uh, dialogue and national policy making. Absolutely, I think those are really great comments, Tom. And I, I want to double click on a, a 
a point that B brought up in that there is a way to have conversations with workers when developing technologies. And I'd like to ask the panel, what are those ways that we can incentivize through policy reform? How can we incentivize technologists and technology vendors to listen to the needs of their end users when developing their technologies? It's something that may happen with some high road, uh, employ, uh, high road technologists, but more and lar- by and large, there's really not an incentive structure for that to happen. Um, the tech vendors will um, respond to the needs of their clients, who oftentimes are not the workers. Okay, most of the time they're not workers. So, um, would love to just see, B, if you have any thoughts, or Christina or Tom, on how can we be thinking about an incentive structure for incorporating worker voice when developing these technologies, in the private sector in particular. Any thoughts? Yeah, maybe I can start out. Um, and I know that my colleagues here have have some deep expertise in this area, but I think that um, you know there are a couple of layers to this. So you asked about public policy, and certainly um, I think that there are mechanisms. Christina mentioned kind of the challenge of of relying only on ex ante uh, impact analysis or consultation. So I think that one thing that we could um, look at from a public policy perspective is kind of ongoing monitoring, ongoing um, conversation or um, impact assessment as it relates to um, these tools being deployed in workplaces. I think it's also the case that, um, you know, from a policy perspective, there is still a lot of um, work and research needed. I think that in many degrees or many um, contexts, there's this frame, even you said it in the frame of this question, that um, assumption that not talking with workers somehow benefits the employer, but I I don't know that that's actually true, right? Like workers are deep experts in the job that they are doing, and it is frequently the case that they bring a lot of expertise to how technology could be developed better that could enrich both their uh, work experience as well as, um, you know, increase um, the capacity, you know, whether it is uh, for productivity's sake, as Christina alluded to, or otherwise um, of their organization. And so I think that we should challenge the notion that those things are at odds. I also think that there is um, a non-public policy side to this, right? There are corporate policies that are also really powerful. And one of the things that um, we're working actually at Aspen Digital on in our frontline AI work is really trying to understand how managers, you know, if you're if you're a if you're a plant manager working in a manufacturing context or whatever the case may be, um, frankly, there are a lot of suggestions to consult with workers or um, you know to to do this work, but frequently translating that to the specific context of um, of the the individual firm or of the individual team or plant um, can still take some effort. And so I think that there's also work. Um, potentially not even in the public policy context, but maybe more in the private policy space of better defining what those steps are, creating greater resources. Christina has been um, leading the way in so many ways for workers to actually um, use technology to voice their own goals and their own um, uh, uh, desires for the development of these tools. So I think that there's also a lot of exciting work to be done in actually leveraging technology um, to support workers in expressing what those things are so that we're not just relying on uh, regulations to prohibit things, but actually actively saying, what are the goals that we're building toward here? What is it that we want to accomplish? Let me let me build on that a little bit. Uh, first of all, there's a, a great phrase that I learned from uh, Japanese auto manufacturers uh, many years ago. And they say it's workers who give wisdom to these machines. And by that, and so Toyota, in its wisdom, listened to workers and to industrial engineers together to to understand what parts of work can we make safer, less ergonomically uh, dangerous, and more productive if we listen to the workers who have the most ideas about how to improve the operations under which uh, they do their work. And that has demonstrated to be a a very highly uh, productive uh, process. Again, by by designing the technology, at the same time we design the work process, 
we then can change both of those to augment what workers' knowledge and skills um, can bring to the table. And so we ought to have policies, either corporate policies that bring workers into those decisions. Every uh, company in the country or in the world for that matter should have a technology advisory committee that brings uh, worker voice along with managers and engineers into those early stage conversations so they can invest wisely and make uh, best use of their dollars. But let's push it back then to two other areas where government could make a difference. I already mentioned that in the US, we've got all this investment in infrastructure and chips and uh, um, uh, uh, the elect uh, new electronics and ways of uh, improving our, our climate. Uh, well, those criteria for funding those projects ought to include criteria that say, are you bringing workers into this process? And if so, how are you doing it? And you're going to be held accountable for doing that as getting um, for getting these funds. The same kind of thing should go to the National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health, uh, all of the, our big funding agencies, when they give grants to universities and other um, industry groups, then they should also say, how are you going to use this technology? How is it going to be um, uh, designed? Are you going to, who is going to be consulted in the design? Build that into our funding at the earliest stages, not to slow down, not to deny that technology can be helpful, but to insist that the right voices are brought into that process. I really appreciated those comments, Tom. Christina would love for you to weigh in. I just, I'd be remiss if I didn't flag. Um, New America, in fact, last fall partnered with the Department of Transportation and Department of Labor for a conversation on making the most of the infrastructure investments and translating them into good jobs. And I should say that we're actually embarking on a similar conversation with our colleagues at NSF and thinking of how we bring the job quality dialogue upstream to the point of R&D investments. The science policy specialist in me resonated soundly with that comment. Christina, turning to you. Thank you. Now, um, mm, several things. So, as a non-American on on this panel, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be very brutally honest, and I think B uh, said this right in the beginning. Uh, the coupling of your healthcare system to employment is one of the trigger points or uh, entry points for the exploitation of labour. The disrespect of labor in your country uh, for many, many workers is for, for an outsider like me, uh, astonishing. So what, what Tom and what B were alluding to, well, come to Europe, <laughs> come to where the labor unions are very strong, have good relationships with the employers, where dialogue is a we thing. We enter into dialogue. It's not a boxing match. If you win, I lose. It's, it is, uh, especially in certain countries, this uh, aim to win-win. You know, we might agree to disagree now and again, but it's more of a win-win situation. So Tom's comment from Japan, I, I love that. And, and it is, and my doctorate was all about the role of social capital, i.e. trust, a common language, dialogue, what role that has in innovation. And I was in very high trust countries like Denmark, and then I was in lesser trust countries back then, Poland, and then least less trust countries, uh, uh, Russia. And how do you get workers in those contexts to feel comfortable about speaking up? But as they did gradually uh, in these, and it was in factories, innovation just exploded through the roof. So it goes to show, as, a, as my, you know, the panelists have said, that the moment you do engage, you take the time to learn from those who are experts at their work is also the time you become more adaptable, more flexible, more innovative. So I, I have to say from an outsider, and I could be horribly wrong, but the, one of the key things in the United States that you need to change is this antagonism between management and labor. You're in this together. And, and the moment you can start saying we about uh, each other, uh, I think a lot of things will change. Um, absolutely. So now I wanted to span out a little bit um, and think about a, a additional stakeholder in all of this, the media. Um, 
something that's been especially top of mind for us at New American World Economic Forum is the storytelling element in this. And the media has contributed to shaping the views and attitudes and understanding of automation, certainly, and the impact of tech at work. Um, policymakers and business leaders, activists, uh, think tankers, we all respond in part to what we read uh, and the narratives that are developed in the media. We've covered a number of very concrete ideas, issues, pinch points, opportunities, but I'd love to go around the panel and ask, what do you believe are key stories that need to be covered right now by journalists and reporters? What's missing? What needs more attention? We've covered a lot of topics. What are some some key highlights that you would flag up for media in particular. And um, maybe we'll start in the order you all appear on my screen, which is B. <laughs> I'm going to be jumping in first again. Um, well, thank you so much. Yeah, I I think that what Christina just said actually is absolutely essential um, to telling this story. I think that there is a notion that uh, that workers and employers are are inevitably um, you know, at odds with one another. And I think that finding examples and telling stories of showcasing where that is not the case, showcasing where, as Christina alluded to, innovation flourishes, uh, where problems are solved and new opportunities are uncovered, um, is a key um, storytelling element for journalists. I also want to reaffirm something that Tom said earlier, which is to make sure that we don't um, afford too much agency to the technology when it is actually just a tool being used by people. Um, my colleagues and I at Aspen Digital have put together a bunch of resources for journalists learning about AI, generative AI, um, where to find experts in AI. And one of the sections that um, we found really useful for folks is literally how to talk about AI. And one of the things that we recommend is make sure that you center the humans in the process, right? Like these, it isn't automation eliminating jobs. It is employers using automation to eliminate jobs. It is not the technology doing the thing on its own, um, but it is people choosing to use a tool um, for, for all kinds of positive and negative consequences. So um, I think another really important story that journalists can tell is to kind of peek behind the curtain, right? Like we're not, this is the, the Wizard of Oz holds a lot of power, but in fact, there are people behind the scenes making these decisions and to shine light on the people and maybe even some of the systemic pressures as I alluded to with kind of the, the, the relative tax on um, capital and labor, those things can ha actually help to maybe remove some of that um, feeling of powerlessness and techno determinism and instead center this on a conversation of human beings and then you know returning to Christina's point when we're talking about human beings we can have a conversation about what are the things that we mutually want to achieve what can we do when we work together yeah. Christina yeah I'm finding that question really difficult because at the moment you know good stories don't sell like, you know, fair trade coffee, if, it, if goodness sold, fair trade coffee would be much more um, <laughs> bought than it is. We need the drama. And I think that that's uh, one of the big things around the media. I wish, so let me be a little bit utopic here. I wish the media would go out there and do exactly what B said, find the anecdotal stories, start asking, well, could this be generalizable in any way? Oh, dialogue is actually good or you know co-creating uh, participatory action an old thing maybe that should come back in uh, that's one thing but the second thing i have a big wish and i'm so thankful for being in the aspen institute for actually having done that work for journalists is see through the narratives you know okay narrative number one regulation stifles innovation I don't know I mean, how many times i have to read that in newspapers across the world every day but it is simply not proven in reality so break the narrative stop repeating the narratives be more diverse in who you speak to to understand this technology at the moment it's the white man <laughs> who's interviewed all the time it's their narrative so so i think in that way a little bit more critical journalism which we all should pay whatever we can pay to make sure we still have uh, and anecdotal stories also of a good nature 
uh, that would be my two wishes. I also see a call to action for, for think tankers and contributing to the storytelling as the, uh, Tom, on to you. Well, I think the answer I would give is go out and talk to workers about it and get their stories. Their stories are positive stories, as uh, my colleagues have alluded to. When you give workers an opportunity to say, how could I make my job better and how could technology help me, you will get all kinds of ideas because workers, in my experience, love to talk about their jobs. And if someone asks them, they are even more excited about it because then they feel respected. One of the best assignments that we've ever done at MIT, well, at least that I've ever done, I shouldn't say for anyone else, is in our class, we, we ask our MBAs, we require our MBAs to go out and talk to real workers, not to their cousins or brother-in-law or sister-in-law or other MBA students, but people on the front line. Ask them about their work, ask them what, what makes them most satisfied, what is their hope and aspiration for the future, how could they make it better, and what are their biggest frustrations? These MBAs come back and say, it's the best assignment I've ever taken on because they tell me some things I don't hear from anywhere else. If we had more people out there talking about getting workers to tell their stories, we would open up, as Christina said, this whole uh, set of issues to innovations that we haven't even dreamed of. And it would make our economy better, our society better, and it would show that we respect worker voice rather than are afraid of it. Absolutely. Can I, can I just please? jump in on, sorry, I, Christina's comment about the realities, uh, the harsh realities of our journalism ecosystem really resonated with me. And I love like calling out like drama cells. Um, and, and I wonder related to, you know, I'm just spitballing here, but related to this conversation around metrics and what are we shooting for? You know, what are, what are we measuring? Um, I wonder if there, like, there is drama in the fact that some companies are doing this well, while other companies are saying it's impossible, it can never be done. Some countries are doing this well, while others are saying that will destroy our economy. So I think that there is drama there. There is drama in uh, maybe calling to, <laughs> calling that juxtaposition out and saying like, wait, wait a minute, you said that this can't possibly be done. And yet here are 10 other examples of it happening. Of course, we need those examples to exist. We need um, people to, as Tom said, go to the front lines and actually um, capture and and amplify those stories, but like, but what's up with that, right? Like, like that, I think that that could be a spicy take uh, for some journalists out there. So I think that when we, we don't have, they don't have to be feel good stories. They can be stories that have some feel good elements, but can also call call to light this like hypocrisy and juxtaposition that we see playing out in the world. So uh, uh, let's not, let's not give up on the drama yet. <laughs> This is a good piece of advice, B. And it's actually a great segue now, uh, moving on to our, our audience Q&A segment. Our first question actually gets at this competitive element among um, our, our, our capitalist uh, ecosystem members, which is that there's one group we haven't gone over yet in the discussion, which is shareholders. What can we do to elevate this discussion to the level of shareholders in the US? Um, how do we influence them to support this goal of elevating worker voice when considering technologies? Would love to see if our panelists have any thoughts. Feel free to jump in. Yeah, Christina. So this goes back to something I've been working on for years and years and years, and that's the logic of the market. Who determines uh, whether the market, and I, I hate, you know, personalizing the market as such, but um, uh, rewards are not behavior. So I think we need to make sure that the rating agencies and others are on board that anti-worker behavior, union busting and the like, or not willingness to engage in conversation with the workers should be penalized. This should, be, you know, unfortunately, Companies do what the market rewards them to do. So we need to change the criteria uh, of the market. And I think this, this is going to be key. Nobody says the way it is now is the only way capitalism can be. We can look at the sort of more stakeholder capitalism forms in other places of the world. So here again, move away from productivity, start prioritizing other things, and then trust me, the 
you will become we, and I think we will have far more dialogue. And I think it, it also uh, is important for investment uh, firms and Wall Street to understand what we're talking about here today and what we're saying, that they're throwing money away when they invest in technology without engaging the workforce and designing it in ways that will actually drive innovation rather than get it resisted or that they'll waste money on trying to reduce labor costs because they, these vendors are claiming they will reduce headcount and, uh, and replace workers. And then the reality is it doesn't work that way. And you get low returns on investment with uh, that approach. So we've got to invest, we've got to educate the investors as well. And I agree with uh, Christina, we got to change the, the, the metrics that uh, we use and we should hold firms accountable for a broader set of outcomes but we also need to uh, educate these these investors who don't have a clue as to how much money is being wasted um, in the way in which technology is being uh, uh, introduced today yeah I'll, I'll actually kind of challenge the notion that investors aren't on board with this like ESG investment has been booming. Um, and, and that indicates an overall kind of cultural shift toward a recognition that, hey, maybe we do need to consider, you know, more than just the short-term revenue growth of an organization. That being said, and actually this is something I left out in the policy overview, is that um, what gets classified as ESG is very wiggly woggly. <laughs> Uh, but right now, there are many efforts around the world to begin to create some more strict guidelines about how that's interpreted. Um, and I think, you know, to the points that my colleagues have made here, there is a, a fantastic opportunity, like Tom said, in kind of like in the procurement space or in the in the research space, kind of saying, okay, if you want to qualify for ESG, here are the things related to job quality and related to worker voice that need to be uh, represented. So I think that actually investors could be pushing us in a positive direction here. But right now, you know, as, as much money is going around as there is, I think that there's still a lot of obfuscation and confusion over what, uh, what responsible investing actually looks like. And if we can have some more structure and better frameworks to give people clarity so that they know that those investment dollars are going to the places where they're actually going to be well spent. Um, I think that the, you know, the, the investment will follow. Um, but, you know, there's this kind of larger ecosystem um, question that has to be shaped up around how do we qualify for ESG categorization? Because many people want to invest in that space. Um, but right now, it's a little bit the Wild West in terms of what counts and what doesn't. Absolutely. I picked up on a number of other uh, uh, breadcrumbs for journalists who might be in the audience today uh, from those comments. So. Uh, thank you all. Um, our next question is for you, Tom, um, and it goes back to one of our, um, uh, the comments you made on a new index to measure uh, job quality. And uh, one of our audience members is wondering if you could expand on um, the current way we evaluate job quality in this country and where you see opportunities for improving that with the metric development you referenced. Sure, thank you for that question. It's a really important one. Well, let's start with the, the Aspen Institute has done a good job of bringing a bunch of uh, academics, industry leaders, labor leaders together to say, well, what, is a, what does job quality really mean? And I think they have a very inclusive definition, uh, certainly with wages and job security and promotion opportunities, the things that we always think of uh, are, are critical elements. But then there's two other things that, uh, uh, two other dimensions that they've introduced, and that is inclusion and diversity and equity uh, as one set of, you know, making sure that everyone uh, in organizations is included in our indices in measuring of job quality. And then the third one, the one that, that, that I've been focused on most directly uh, with the um, Families and Workers Institute is basically how do you, is bringing worker voice into this concept of job quality? And how do we measure worker voice? How do we make sure that it's part of a comprehensive um, uh, measure of job quality? So 
yes, the objective and traditional wages, job security, promotion, security, and safety is, is important. Uh, equity and inclusion is important and worker voice. If you bring those three dimensions together um, and, and then you have a much more holistic concept of job quality. We've got to develop good measures of all of those and then we've got to get the resources to go out and collect the data that's necessary to see how we're doing. Shalene, can I add to that? Because yes, I, I, I just find that that's a wonderful project, but can I also add something? We use very horrible terms about certain workers. It's unskilled labor, for example, or you know, uh, low paid or whatever it may be. And I think we should challenge ourselves in this job quality discussion to also say, how can we start rewarding work of all kinds, not necessarily financially only, but also ethically, socially, that people feel rewarded for what they do. Somebody might want to be a janitor because that's what they like doing. Yet we call that person a derogative word as, as unskilled labor, right? Um, so I really think, you know, the job quality is an individual, it's emotional, it's a subjective thing. It can be measured with, via fixed criteria, but we should also lift it to a systemic level. How are we holding certain jobs in low quality because of the way we name them? Yeah, no, that's a really great uh, additional point, Christina. And I think tracks with public opinion data we've seen on what people value in their work. Uh, so um, our next question uh, really gets at, um, you know, I, I think a comment that, that all of you have touched on uh, earlier in the discussion, which, um, well, we, I think we've, we've, we've maybe uh, circled it, but we haven't quite addressed it. So we've been discussing quite a bit about um, how technology changes work and how workers can influence the technology development and deployment process. Next question that we've received is around how workers can be trained uh, or educated in school and in college or other uh, career and technical training programs to thrive in a work environment that is going to be uh, more dynamic in, in lieu of work. Uh, and would love for our panelists to weigh in on that question. Any takers? Yeah, I, I'm like, that's for you, Shaylin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not on the panel. <laughs> Christina, why don't you go ahead and then I'll... I'll yeah, yeah. I mean, Shailen, actually, Shailen, we're going to put you on the panel. <laughs> what do you think? Well, I, I think this is... I, I'm really glad this question came up because I actually think it's one that is at the heart of a lot of work we've been doing at the Center of Education and Labor, which is really trying to um, think about the workforce implications of the future of work and how we sort of operationalize this. Um, and I think there are sort of two dimensions that come to mind for me. The first is how do we go at better anticipating the skills that folks will need to thrive in these new jobs that are going to be changed to work? And you know, right now, I think there's there's a couple of ways to, to approach that. One is using real-time labor market information. You know, you evaluate job postings, to see what employers are saying they need by way of the skills they require. But there are limitations to what we can learn with that. There's limitations to the data that um, we can really lean on. Most real-time LMI relies on, you know, aggregate uh, collection of job postings data and LinkedIn data to inference skills. We know that when you meet with employers and talk to them about their uh, hiring needs, what job descriptions say may not align with what's actually under the hood. That being said, it is, I think, a relatively robust measure for us to look at and trying to get a sense of the skills folks will need uh, and how those skills are changing over time for certain occupations. So I know Department of Labor has had a number of pilots with sort of bringing the data-driven piece and anticipating the skills that are emerging from this work. I'd be remiss if I didn't say that we are actually in the midst of uh, doing emerging technology 
uh, workforce development research uh, with a number of partners with community colleges as a focus in the US. What is the role of community colleges in aligning technology and talent development? The other dimension, and I think Tom, you touched on this in the context of, of R&D funding and the creation of new technologies in the first place, is for us to uh, really try to think about workforce development when we're incentivizing the creation of these technologies by way of research, by way of development. Um, when I was at the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, uh, we had partnered with uh, the late Emily DeRocco, former Assistant Secretary of Labor, to think about how we go about uh, road mapping for education and skills alongside um, the technology development plans at, at R&D agencies. And, you know, I think from that work, we learned that there actually really isn't a sophisticated understanding of how we could do that. So it's an area of opportunity to sort of um, uh, refine that. So thank you, B, for the opportunity to, to sort of chime in with my own thoughts, but would love to see what the panelists say just in reaction to that. Um, any, any perspectives? Just a, a really quick uh, uh, point. Uh, the best labor market data that I know shows that it's the hybrid skills that are paying off. It's not just the, the analytical skills and the knowledge of computer technology and so on. That's necessary. But it's also the social skills. What can you do? Can you communicate? Can you lead? Can you negotiate? Can you manage? Can you work in teams? Can, can you analyze? Uh, how um, uh, things could be improved and communicate that. So let's not forget the importance of those social skills and we need to build that in with technology. And then I'm gonna make a pitch for the most successful forms of, of training that I think we um, uh, have ever invented. And that's called apprenticeships. And apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeships, getting the students in our high schools, and as you said, Shayla, in our community colleges and, and technical schools, engaged with the employers and with unions early on in shaping uh, on the job and in the classroom combined learning, combined with placement of these uh, young people, especially now as we spend so much money now on infrastructure investment, increasingly there are community benefit agreements that are negotiated into those, which are bringing people of color and people who have been excluded and women into these uh, so-called trades and into the, to the jobs which will be growing in the future. And they will get state-of-the-art training on technology and they will get state-of-the-art training on leadership and, and, and teamwork and problem solving. So let's use that concept of an apprenticeship where we learn in the classroom, we apply it on the job, and there's a link to a real good high quality job when people graduate from those programs. Absolutely, Tom. Christina B, any additional thoughts? Couldn't agree enough, Tom. Just Do you want to go B? Then I'll... Okay. No, I just, going back to what I, I think I remember the question was, uh, it's around adaptability, really, right? And if you are scared that you're going to lose your job any given moment, if you lose your job, you lose your health insurance, you lose everything, then your willingness to adapt, to change, to confront all of this is, of course, much less than, for example, in a country like Denmark, where we have a very strong safety net. So it's not just the workers who are backwards thinking against change and all of these things. It's also a systemic issue um, on, on the grand scale. right? So make it safer. I mean, the flexible Danish labor market is a great example of you can get fired tomorrow, but there will always be a safety net holding you until you find another job. Um, so lots of things, and of course, training. I love that Tom said apprenticeships because yes, I think academics should have included in their uh, education as well, apprenticeships. Um, and of course, that we make it uh, incentivize our companies to open up for those apprenticeships on good conditions. So totally agree, thanks. Yeah, Absolutely. Maybe to, to add on to that as well, just like, Employers, you know, I love that you're tracking all of this uh, job rec, you know, job listing data to see what employers are asking for. But like, sometimes employers need to train people after they've hired them, <laughs> right? Like, like it's it's great to look for people who already have all the skills that you want. Um, but I think that like related to apprenticeships, recognizing that employers, 
you know, if employers want the workforce of tomorrow, they may have to invest in in training up the workforce of tomorrow. And and people have a great de deal of uh, positive association with employers who help them to do that. Right, turnover, the cost of churn, and and especially um, in some of these frontline roles is incredibly expensive. Recruiting people and retraining people is like incredibly expensive to companies. If you can keep people around by retraining them or giving them access to opportunities, like not only are you saving your business money, but you're also creating, cultivating a company culture of goodwill, um, which I think is is something that is a win-win surely for everyone. I couldn't think of a, a, a better capstone because we're out of time, unfortunately. Uh, I'd like to just take a moment to thank all of you, our distinguished panel, and and Rian Kay, and all of you in the audience today for joining us for this discussion. Um, I I couldn't uh, um, uh, think of a, a better way to really kick off the first public dialogue around this New America World Economic Forum partnership, and I'm really excited to carry on the discussions with each of you, Christina, Tom, B and our audience members and our broader partner network. So thank you again very much for joining us today. Thank you. Take care, so everyone.